Well, good morning, good morning. Good to have good to have each of you here. How many of you felt the wind this morning? Yeah. Well, it's going to be that way. It's going to be that way until they build that mall right out here. When that mall's here, it'll break that wind and we won't have it so bad. So that'll be in 30, 40 years. Well, we're getting close to Christmas. We've got a lot of stuff up. If you notice all the Christmas decorations, also in the back, there's those boxes where if you're going to uh, give care of Christmas cards to anybody within the church, you can just dump them in the boxes. They're alphabetized, so that'll help us. It'll make it easier for us to sort it, plus contain them all. So if you're going to give a card to somebody in the church, you can just drop it in the box. That way you don't have to put a stamp on there. You can just put the 50 cents in, in the box. No, you don't have to do that. Uh, also, we have calendars. Uh, for the next year uh, from the church and the calendars are on the back table back in the back there in the lobby There's also a, a letter there from the staff wa wanting to wish you a Merry Christmas and thanking you for being so supportive So after service pick up a calendar and uh, one of the letters there too Then of course tonight is going to be the uh, orchestra ensemble uh, performance and we're looking forward to it looks like we're gonna have a pretty good crowd if there's still somebody you think you need to invite or you'd like to walk around the neighborhood we do have flyers out on the kiosk in the lobby make sure you can pick up some flyers and take them then the cantata will be next week the choir cantata will be next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and they're also doing it at 6 o'clock there's plenty of flyers out there also that you can take and use after the cantata next Sunday night we'll be having a cookie fellowship and so <coughs> We need you to bring cookies, and uh, that way after the cantata, people can go over there and just have a good time of fellowship. So we've got a lot of things going on. Um, Wednesday night service uh, will also be there. So other announcements are in your bulletin. Veterans of Faith have their Christmas uh, dinner this Thursday, and uh, you need to sign up by tomorrow in order to get that done. I think that is all the announcements. You got that all straight? Everything's ready? Uh, in your mind and ready to know what to do. We're going to have a word of prayer and then we've got a, a very special uh, start start for our service this morning. We've got a piano quartet. They're only using two pianos, which is unusual, but I'd like to see if you get the piano quartet on just one piano. Could you do it? Can't, can't do that? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for each one that is here. We look forward to the service this morning uh, for the things... Uh, for the orchestra ensemble tonight and for all the things that are going on we thank you that we have that privilege to be able to do that bless our service this morning in jesus name amen
Well, good morning. Let's stand, take our hymn books out, turn hymn number 249. Oh, come all ye faithful. As soon as our penis gets... There we go. 249. Oh, come all ye faithful. attention and everyone else is. Over to 259, angels from the realms of glory. Shepherds in the fields of 
77. Hark the herald angels sing. can be dismissed to Children's Church. On the second, Christ my highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, great in time behold Him now, offspring of the Virgin's womb. In the church the God has child is this.
Let's pray together. Father, how blessed we are to be in your house this morning. How blessed we are for you to bring your presence here to meet with us this morning. How blessed we are for the reason, for the season that we're singing about. And we thank you that you've blessed us so much that we can bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse and that you will use them to further your kingdom, that you will use them to uh, help our missionaries and we will rejoice, Father, to know that uh, this season is to thank you for sending your son and blessing each one of us this morning. Thank you for your presence here in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Glory to God. Wow. You're not going to want to miss tonight, 6 o'clock this evening. And if you don't drive at night, uh, talk to somebody here. They'll definitely go and pick you up. Or better yet, take one of your flyers and go to your neighbor's house and invite them and say, by the way, can you give me a ride? <laughs> You're not going to want to miss it. There's uh, all the pictures with the music and so forth, the ensemble, and uh, it's really going to be good. Next Sunday morning now, at 9 o'clock, instead of having our adult Sunday school class, we will meet in the fellowship hall and we'll have donuts and coffee and orange juice there. And then the cantata will be at 10, and then again, 10 o'clock Sunday evening, so you can bring uh, friends and so forth. So a lot of good things taking place. Colossians chapter 2. It's our text this morning. This is a message I did three years ago, four years ago. Uh, but we have so many new people, plus I think there's some things in here that uh, you'll want to hear again. So we're going to share that with you this morning. Let's stand together. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. <clears throat> Verse 16 of Colossians 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly, by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishing, nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will, and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning thanking you as we have already worshiped. We've been able to worship in song. We've been able to worship in giving. We just thank you for that. And now as we look to your word and the things that are here, may we understand what this season is all about. May we understand what you want to do with us. May we just simply understand what the Holy Spirit is telling us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. I believe that probably beginning, oh, probably about 50 years ago, the church allowed secular society to infringe and really dictate, dictate to us more and more of their thoughts, their beliefs, their practices of how they feel like a church should fit into society. And consequently, for a lot of church today, we have what we have today, and that is a politically correct society, trying to regulate the church. We no longer seem to have a government by, of, and for the people. Politicians are now trying to tell us what we are to do and how to do it. They even want to legislate our holidays. As Christians, as believers, Christmas is a very important holiday to us. And we get protective and have high expectations for this holiday. You know, the clamor for, from Christianity today is how secular society is trying to silence us, we the church, to cause us to go away. What can we do about it? What should we do about it? If they can legislate how we worship and what we say and who we give homage to, they're going to do that if we allow them to do that. At Christmas time, we talk about, as we just saw in the, the projections up here, about how that sweet little baby in the manger, that's what it's all about, is God. Creator, sustainer, judge of all things, the one that gives us salvation. We've tried to emphasize this year, and we will throughout the rest of this Christmas season, as that we're to keep Christ in Christmas. That's why on the sign up above, Christ is bolder than the rest of the, the lettering up there. You hear the question so many times, both by the secular world and the Christian world. Has Christmas been ru ruined by commercializing it? Yeah, I think so. Even in our family times, instead of talking about what Christmas Day is all about, it's become all about football games, going to the mall, other kinds of trivial things. I read this statement, and I think it's a good one. It says, abuse of a good thing by some people does not forbid the right use of it by others. I'm so thankful that God has always had his remnant, those who stay by the word and by what God wants. So now we have a remnant 
How are we to look at Christmas? How are you and I as believers to look at Christmas? How do we go past the politically correct police? How do we sidestep the commercialization of it all? And give God, truly give God the glory, the praise that He deserves. Well, as being part of His remnant, we continue to celebrate. We continue to promote Christmas as the time that God gave us His greatest gift, His Son, so that we could have eternal life. And however you celebrate Christmas and whatever traditions you have, the important thing is to do, the important thing to do is to glorify Him in all that you do. So what I want to do this morning for just a little bit is go through some of our traditions that we have. Let's see where they originated. And do they still have a meaning for us? The first one is the symbol X. Symbols of Christmas, the symbol X. Now I've had a problem with people saying Xmas. Thinking that X stood for an unknown quantity. Because Christmas is not unknown to us. We know what it's all about. But in fact, that X comes from the first letter of the word Christ. Christos in the Greek. It was the symbol for Christ. And in the 13th century, there was a general illiteracy. And so Francis of Assisi wanted to illustrate to people the birth of Christ. And so he used this symbol in the manger scene. If you look at the manger scenes, they've got X-shaped stalls for the animals. And the bottom of the X was the legs of the manger. So that's what he used. So the X became a symbol of the birth of Christ. Personally, I think it's better to write out Christmas because of the connotation that X has today. And a lot of people don't understand unless, of course, we get to explain it. But symbols are what we make of them. Secondly is Earth Day. Earth Day. Man celebrates a day which worships the earth. That should be no surprise to us. Scripture tells us that there will be a time when men would worship the creation more than the Creator. Don't we see that happening today? Worshiping the creation more than the Creator? We're definitely thankful for God's creation and the beauty of all of it. We enjoy that. But it should simply cause us to look upward and to praise God for all of His glory and wisdom in His creativity and what He has given to us to enjoy. Third, Temples. Temples to church buildings. In the fourth century, man began to build Christian churches and taking place of what they believed to be heathen temples. They had turned into heathen temples. Sometimes, though, they used the foundation of the temple for their building of the church. This was to show a triumph of the gospel over heathenism. Symbolically, they were saying that once where a temple of Satan stood is now we are giving God the glory. I've also heard of those who are starting churches and they've taken what, gone to a downtown of their particular town, what once was a bar, they turned it into a church and they said now it is being used for the glory of God. We need to understand this. God did not give us religion. God gave us revelation. That's His Son, Jesus Christ. He revealed to us who He is and what He wants to do. That is what God gave us. And man has made religion, and sometimes this religion that man has made is because of the rejection of God's revelation. They reject Jesus Christ. They reject things in the Bible, and so they create their own religion. And I think there have been a lot of religions that have certainly been inspired by Satan. Satan does not have a problem with religion. And any religion that does not base its teachings and doctrine solely on Christ, the Word of God, is a man-made religion. It's not this building that is holy. It's not the religious materials that are holy. It's not our decorations. It's not the colors of the walls. It's not the carpet. It's where God meets with us. Scripture says, where two or three are gathered, I am there. What has made this place holy this morning is because you are here. And God is going to meet with us. We got to look beyond the colors, the structures, the placement of everything. The reason that God is in this church is because you're here and He wants to meet with you. Well, the fourth thing, December 25th, we say that's the birthday of Christ. We're not sure. We're not sure what day Christ was born. In fact, in the early church, they did not focus on the birth of Christ, they focused on the resurrection. That was what was important. And the ultimate symbol was not the manger, but the cross. 
and the empty tomb. In Romans chapter 14, it tells us it's not the day that is important because it's evident Christ was born. He was born. So why do we celebrate December 25th? Well, it really comes from a heathen festival to represent the days beginning to get longer. We know that December 21st is the shortest day and the days start to get longer. So they use December 25th to say, now the years or the days are starting to get longer and they caused it to be a day of celebration. Well, the symbol here is that after a long night of sin, God sent his son so that darkness began gradually to turn back to light. That's what it's all about. Man lives in darkness and he needs the light. And that, of course, is Jesus Christ. Once again, Christians felt like they were taking away a symbol of heathenism and making it a symbol of Christianity. Maybe today we're having the tables turned on us. They are taking Christmas away from the Christians and making it a heathen uh, celebration. It's up to you. It's up to you to keep Christ in Christmas. The word Christmas means the celebration of Christ because the word mass means celebration. And of course, if you have Christ celebration, it is the celebration of Christ. There's nothing sacred. There's nothing holy about December 25th. We read that in the scripture text this morning. But it is good to commemorate someday to celebrate God sending his son to pay for our sins. So we have December 25th. But it's up to you and I to relate to people what it's all about. What about the Christmas tree? The Christmas tree. Well, we don't worship trees, though the heathens in the Middle Ages did. Well, I guess we do have some worshiper of trees today. We call them tree huggers. <laughs> there is another truth of man worshiping the creature more than the creator. Scripture signifies the tree as a symbol of life, and it bears fruit. There are going to be trees that lie in the streets of heaven. We read that in Scripture. It was Martin Luther who really began the Christmas tree tradition. He showed his family the tree whose branches pointed upwards towards heaven. The light symbolized the, word of the, the light of the world, God. And using an evergreen was to symbolize never dying, always alive. And so the tree is a symbol. And if you have a tree, that's fine. If you don't have a tree, that's okay too. It's between you and the Lord. How about Christmas bells? The bells that we have. Bells were used to announce an event. It could be to announce an alarm, a warning, a caution, or a celebration. I think Christmas bells, we can look at it, and it's used for all of these. The event is God sent his son, so we ring the bells. The warning is Satan is a master today, a master deceiver, and he will try to get those to follow him. The caution is time is short. You better make your life right with the Lord. And the celebration is he will take all of those who have accepted him as Savior to eternal life. So bells. How about holly? Holly. Oh, the sharp and pointed leaves. Show us how Jesus had to suffer for us when he died on that cross. The red berries signify the blood that was shed so that you and I could have eternal life. Holly. Candles. Candles give light and fire. And that represents security, protection, warmth, spiritual illumination, which we have in Jesus Christ. Think about the security that you have in your salvation. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you know that when this life is over, it's just beginning the eternal life with Him. The security you have. The protection that you have, He says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. He is continually with us. That's the protection. Oh, the warmth. It's warm to be in here in this fellowship. Several of you came in and as I was shaking your hand, He said, oh, my hand is cold. Well, but it's warm now. You're in here in this fellowship. The illumination. To know that so many who don't know where this world is headed. But we do. We do. We are to be light to the rest of the world. How about the hearth? English tradition of burning the Yule log. It was brought, on, brought in on Christmas Eve and it was banked so that it would have burned slowly for the entire 12 days of Christmas. 
and it was to be lighted using a fragment that remained from the previous Christmas, suggesting continually from year to year, generation to generation. They would just save a little bit of it, start the fire next year for the next generation to see. I don't know about passing down traditions or which ones, but I do know we have a responsibility, each one of us, to share with our children, our grandchildren, our faith, what God has done in our life, what He wants to do in their life. I am saddened by how I think we have children growing up today who do not get the Christmas, the real Christmas story, the true meaning of what Christmas is all about. So this hearth, it signifies warmth and a home place where there is trust. How about the mistletoe? What's the mistletoe all about? Well, it has a very highly significant symbolism. It was hung in the entryway of a home. And so if you had a conflict with a neighbor or somebody else, when they would come through that, it would signify the need to resolve that problem. That was what the mistletoe was all about. Because you wanted to end the year right with one another. You wanted to make relationships good again. Mistletoe signified that. And then the last one is gifts. And of course, we understand that. Sharing gifts signifies the greatest gift of all. The gift that He gave to us, His Son. And so then we share with others the gift and we're simply saying to you, um, I, I appreciate you, I enjoy you, I want to give you this gift, I thought about you. But really it's telling them, Jesus Christ, special in my life, I want Him to be special in your life. And so you need to enjoy Christmas. Enjoy the traditions, but understand the symbolism of all of that. Keeping Christ in Christmas shows His Spirit in giving and caring and making amends and sharing the gospel. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 8 says this, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. As Christians, we are constantly being challenged not just about keeping Christ in Christmas, but keeping Him in our lives. Society constantly challenges us. You may even have family members who challenge your Christianity. And we're made to feel ashamed, embarrassed, even apologetic for everything that goes on in this politically correct society. For a few anti-Christian elements to try and dictate to us that because we are Christians, we should crawl into a shell. We should stay there against everything that the Creator of all living things purposed for this world and not tell anybody about it? Not so. Christians are to be an influence. God wanted Christianity to have influence over everything. Over everything. And that goes on after He calls us light, salt of the earth the light of the world. As, as Christians, we, to, we are to influence knowledge. Scripture acknowledges that. Who named all the animals? Adam, God's chosen one there. Daniel was the wisest in his land. The, book, the Bible says that Solomon was the most, had the most wisdom ever. John the Baptist, Jesus said of him, no man was ever born of woman like him. The Bible tells us that the older are to teach the younger. Christian parents are to teach their children when they wake up and throughout the entire day. God wants us to take the knowledge, the, the, the things that He has given to us, and to share with others. We don't sit as dumb in a corner and say nothing. We are to share. Secondly, as Christians, we are to be industrious. Abraham was the wealthiest man in the, on the earth. Job had great riches and was given even more. Solomon was so rich that the world came to see his riches. Nehemiah rebuilt the holy city. We're to work. We're to be industrious. We're to show this lost world that God has placed within us the ability, the talents to do something, to get something done, to create. The world needs to see that. As Christians, we're to be leaders. You look at King David, Joseph, King Hezekiah, all were leaders, and we're to stand up and we are to lead. God never intended for Christians to take a back seat and to apologize for being a Christian. 
I think it's sad today that our leaders in America are listening to the wrong people. They're listening to the wrong people when they say we must take Christianity out of the schools, take Christianity out of politics, take Christianity out of lawmaking, take Christ out of Christmas. The, the leaders are listening to those kind of people who, who are shouting and, and claiming for those kinds of things to happen, and they're doing it. They have taken Christianity out of the schools, politics, lawmaking, and Christ out of Christmas. There was a poll by Newsweek. It said that, it found out that 77% of Americans believe in the virgin birth. 67 of, of Americans believe the entire story of Christmas. 55 of Americans believe the Bible to be literally accurate. 93% believe that Jesus actually lived. 82% of them said that Jesus is God and 52% believe in the return of Christ. We have so many polls today that are telling us that none of that is true. And we need to understand that there are people who believe the Christmas story. They believe that Jesus was born. They believe that God sent him. The poll went on to say this when the question was asked, what if there was no Jesus? 61% of them said there would be less kindness. 47% of them said there would be more war. 63% there would be less charity. 58% said there would be less tolerance. 55% said there would be less personal happiness. 86% of Americans say religion has influence over life or should have influence over life in the United States. 62% favor of teaching of creation science. 43% favor of the teaching exclusively of creation science. How can we, and we've done this, how can we allow a minority of people to change the way that this country has been for over 200 years? We've done that. As a believer in Christ, as a Christian, I cannot dishonor my Heavenly Father by not saying Merry Christmas. I must say Merry Christmas. I cannot discredit my Savior by taking a back seat, socially, politically, morally, just because I believe in Jesus Christ as Creator, the only Redeemer of sin-cursed world, America included. How can we stand by? How can we stand by and let people take pot shots at God? His Word, His Church, His people. We must stand up and say something about that. And because of a few agnostic, sin-filled individuals who shout the loudest, then every one of us are to back off I'm tired of backing off. It's time that we move forward. It's time that we as believers in Jesus Christ, knowing and understanding the truth of God, that we speak up. We must do that. We, have, we as Christians have been given a mandate by God, by the creator of this world. And he said, you are to be involved in the values of this country. We are left here to change people's hearts and minds to give them the answer, the eternal answer that God provided. If that were not so, then the moment we got saved, we might as well have been taken to heaven. We'd be better off there. But he left us here to share the gospel message. God has commanded us to be light and salt, not to cower, not to hide. We're to be an influence. We must march forward. Too many times we as Christians crawl into a shell we're afraid to say, do anything about it. We can't be afraid. We cannot be afraid to tell people that we're a Christian, that we believe the Bible is the Word of God and we believe that every word in it is truth. And man must hear it and believe it. We cannot be afraid to believe in the divine Creator. Don't be afraid to say that you believe in divine judgment that befalls every man who has entrusted in Christ. If we cannot share the gospel truth, the gospel message, which is, which is clear, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to have eternal life with Him. If you don't, it's eternal separation from God. Don't be afraid to say sin is sin. Don't be afraid to name homosexuality as an abomination against God. It is. It is. God destroyed an entire city 
an entire group of people because of it. Don't be afraid to say abortion is the murder of an innocent child. America's had to answer for that. Don't be afraid to say that immorality and lewdness is wrong. It is wrong. If somebody says to you, Happy Holidays, don't be afraid to say, you mean Merry Christmas, don't you? The definition of Christmas is the celebration of Christ. That's what the name means. It's the celebration of Christ. And don't let a few anti-God people take that away from us. We cannot do that. How dare they take that away from us? Something that has been celebrated for 2,000 years. We're allowing that to happen. You want to keep Christ in Christmas? Then stand up, speak up, and move forward. Amen. You've got to do it. The church and Christianity has got to stop retreating. We've been doing that for too long. And look where we're at. I don't know. Maybe God is going to give this nation one last chance. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Oh, beloved, make sure that you tell people about the love of Christ. Tell them about His mercy. Tell them about His willingness to forgive a sinful people if they'll come to Him. Share the gospel message. The greatest gift that you could give this year is salvation to somebody. Give them that knowledge, that hope, that joy of eternal life. You've got loved ones. You've got neighbors. You've got co-workers. You might already be thinking about a gift getting for them. What they need is Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we'll give a verse of invitation. And I trust that as you listen to the message this morning that the Holy Spirit has prompted you to do something, to say something, to share. And after we stand and begin singing, you might want to just come to this altar and say, Lord, I give you my Christmas. It's yours. Father, we pray. As we think about the message this morning and we think about where the church is in relation to society, in relation to what's been going on. we failed. We have failed. And it begins with each one of us individually, those of us that are believers. We have got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead of worrying so much about what gifts we're going to purchase, we need to realize the gift that you already did purchase through your Son, Jesus Christ. May we be free. May we be wise. May we have the courage to share your son with somebody else. What a gift. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing page 106, Worthy You Are Worthy. If you want to come to the altar, just pray for a moment. If you want to bring somebody with you, just say, let's just go pray for a moment. Why don't we do that as we sing? Worthy You are worthy King of kings Lord of Lords, you are worthy, worthy, you are worthy, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, 
thank you for being here this morning. Let me encourage you to come tonight. You are really going to appreciate it, enjoy it, and of course next Sunday morning also. Bring somebody with you, but let me tell you, you better come early if you want to get a good seat. So we're going to have a good time tonight at 6 o'clock. Red, you come and dismiss us in prayer, would you please, sir? Don't forget there are calendars in the back and also a letter from the staff that you want to pick up. Just, just kidding. I told him to tell everybody to sit down. This is going to take a while. There's so many blessings out there we don't acknowledge. Please don't look past the blessing of our pastor and the fact that the truth is the truth and that is it. It strengthens my heart every time he preaches. I told my mom when I picked her up this morning, I need a real good dose of Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. Father God, we come before you in this holiday season. We lift up Christ, Lord. We thank you for that present, that blessing, that eternal life that comes with it. We ask, Lord, that you help us to shine as we travel throughout the community, that someone may see, catch a glimpse of the truth and the law and all of the things that you have put in us. Father God, there is no other way. Do not let us mistake that. Father God, as we go forth this week, help us to share the greatest present of all, and that's your love through your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>